go to Gary Michelson for this generosity. We're at something of a turning point in the careers of the individuals and possibly also in the epidemic, which has slowed down a lot of people's research and a lot of work, uh, just simply not able to get to laboratories and so on. And so it makes this year's round all the more exciting, all the more extraordinary that these young people have been able to do so much in the time of COVID. Uh, our next round, by the way, will open for nominations on April 1st. So make a note as you watch this, if you're considering the possibility of applying for the fifth round of Gary Michelson prizes. This is of course also brought to you by the Human Vaccines Project, which has for many years been seeking to find truly uh, spectacular innovations in immunology and in our understanding of how the human immune system works, literally trying to map the entire human immune system to know how it responds to disease and causes disease, which both of which we will be talking about today in the context of these fantastic prizes. And I want to first begin by introducing you to the man who runs the Human Vaccines Project, Dr. Wayne Koff, who's been in the business of searching for vaccines for four decades now, once at the NIH, at the Human Vaccines Project, uh, the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative, and now running the Human Vaccines Project. Wayne, over to you. I'm much younger than that, you know, Laurie. I don't think I've been doing this for four decades, but it does seem like a long time. Well, listen, it's it's really it's it's wonderful to be here. This is is one of the best of the days of the years for us, um, and and um, this was an unbelievably complex, you know, year, uh, and and we got over you know 150 applications in this this round of the proposals. And I just want to congratulate all of the of the of the winners. They are exceptional, exceptional scientists. Um, and and you'll see in a minute the the interesting proposals that they have. Um, obviously, that there there um, wouldn't be a Michelson Prize if if not for the incredible amount of of the vision uh, and generosity of. Um, Ali and Gary Michelson. Um, and so um, I'm not going to make a laudatory introduction. Gary, I know it. Thank um, you. He, he, he wouldn't want that. And so I want to go ahead uh, and, and just go ahead and int introduce Gary uh, and, you know, and thank him again for, um, you know, being an incredible partner with us on this the, the journey here of the Michelson Prize. So I'll turn it over to you, Gary. Thank you, Wayne. Um, there's an old saying that one can complete the chasm in several small steps. And while most science is incremental, I believe that great science leaps. So what does it do, take to do great science? And I think five things. It requires intellect, knowledge, imagination, courage, and perseverance. So why courage? Well, first, because this type of research either pushes past the known limits or attempts to disprove the orthodoxy of the moment. And of course, there's a substantial likelihood that it will not succeed. Now, not succeeding is not the same as failing unless that is where you stop. Now, I see these qualities not exclusively in young people, but very much in our young scientists. Um, these young research prizes have succeeded beyond my expectations because apart from the research itself, the prizes have markedly accelerated the career paths of each of the recipients. And, and that's just been a blessing. I'd like to thank Wayne and the Human Vaccines Project for all of their work. This could not have been done without them. It's a great relationship we have and thank you so much. I'd like to congratulate this year's winners and I would just say, as a final remark, if the past is prelude, then the three of you should really buckle up for what's going to be a fabulous ride. Thank you. And thank you again, Gary, for your generosity and your comments. I'm going to take us on a short path through 
a major conundrum we currently face in the COVID fight that has implications writ large for our understanding of human immunology and uh, show you some interesting findings that perhaps will trigger some thoughts for next year's applicants for the Michelson Prize. We're, we're on a journey that involves long COVID and in particular involves what is going on in the brain and how the SARS-CoV-2 virus or the immune response to the virus is affecting the capacities and functioning of the brain. This was noticed from the very beginning. Uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci in 2020 was talking about this strange phenomenon referred to as brain fog, one of the many long symptoms uh, suffered by people who have survived COVID but continue to have lingering symptoms for, we don't know how long, frankly. It could be, in some cases, horrible to imagine that we're seeing permanent changes. Certainly, we've seen that the virus is expressed in the cerebellum. It, it can be found in various parts of the brain on autopsy and is clearly colonizing and reproducing in the brain, uh, therefore has obviously crossed the blood-brain barrier. Some of the symptoms early on noted uh, two years ago with SARS-CoV-2 infection came to be called long COVID, and they included mostly symptoms that are associated with mental health, fatigue, uh, brain fog, sleep disorders, periodic fevers, anxiety, depression, nervousness, a whole host of different symptoms, all basically pretty vague, hard to pin down in clear diagnostic terms. Uh, they overlap with, of course, symptoms felt elsewhere in the body uh, and that affect the cardiovascular system and the pulmonary system. Uh, some of the clearest ones is this loss of sense of taste and smell. Um, and less clear are these sort of brain fog, loss of concentration, the, the sense that you're pushing through some kind of mud in your brain just to pull your thoughts together and to follow what someone is saying to you. The path to recovery can be long. And in some cases, we have not yet seen full recovery in, in key individuals from this list of uh, long COVID effects. And this means that the priority is there to understand especially what is going on in the brain. By introducing sophisticated brain scan technology to see what is actually happening in the brains of people, both during acute COVID and for the months thereafter, some interesting things are beginning to come to light. But before we get there with the details, we need to understand that the epidemiology of this is extremely complicated. And it's been, uh, up, up to now, I would say really impossible to separate out the multitude of factors that could contribute to uh, brain fog, to fatigue, and, and frankly, to death. And keep in mind that the majority of the people who have been dying from COVID have been seniors, people over 65 years of age. And that means that uh, they already have a whole plethora of pre-existing conditions that may play into the picture in trying to understand what's going on with uh, these long-term effects. And we may also see simple exacerbation of uh, latent or pre-existing problems in the brains. That complicates things. In addition, uh, we see that those who already had dementia or Alzheimer's diagnoses, uh, if they were in nursing homes, or were on Medicare in large scale surveys turn out to, to have had their symptoms and their likelihood of demise greatly enhanced during the COVID pandemic. And here again, we have to ask ourselves how much of this may be because of viral infection. And you see markedly different rates of Alzheimer complications between those who were diagnosed with COVID versus those who were not. But also the nursing home experience itself was already perhaps not a particularly pleasant experience. Add to that, that at the height of our COVID epidemic in the United States, we shut down access. Pa families could not be with their loved ones. Uh, patients were isolated. 
And isolation, of course, contributes to all the negative symptoms of Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. And this has further complicated uh, everything about trying to understand long COVID and in particular, the neurological symptoms. We just don't have good definitions. Steve Deeks was speaking recently in one of the Human Vaccine Project's uh, routine webinars and addressed this very uh, strongly saying that until we can really pin down some consensus diagnoses so that we know what we're talking about and have methods for clear measurement that are agreed across the board, all of this is going to be very difficult to fully understand, much less treat. And there are incentives for getting to the bottom of this because it looks like a lot of what we're seeing in the brains of people with uh, long COVID are similar to contributors that we would call aging brains or uh, brains frankly leading into dementia. And this may help us better understand those syndromes. So for example, um, we see a huge increase in all forms of mental illness in young people across the board. Meta-analysis combing through multiple studies, 29 studies, more than 80,000 young people involved. You see an increase during COVID, 25% depression, 20% anxiety. And this is a problem seen all over the world. Now, is this because they had COVID or is this because they're isolated? because they're not going to school, because they're having to spend so much time with their parents <laughs> and siblings. You know, so many factors are involved in trying to appreciate why these mental syndromes should be in play. And this is of course also true across the board for adults. We've seen a nearly 28% increase in major depressive disorder worldwide and a nearly 26% increase in anxiety disorders. So again, this is complicated. And is this correlation or causation? Are we looking at the virus causing syndromes or are these larger societal issues? For example, this study out of Boston shows that um, a great deal of the depression and anxiety is, was associated in the United States with financial stress. And you see a class differential based on the ability of people to be resilient financially during the COVID lockdowns uh, in terms of whether or not they express depression and recover from it. So this suggests that we're not looking at a pathological process, but a psychosocial process. Um, but of course that doesn't take care of all of it. Um, studies in the UK have shown a tremendous increase in mental illness, uh, a frank diagnosis of 11% escalation amongst those who have been diagnosed with COVID. And brain scans have indeed found changes taking place inside the brains of people who have even had mild cases. We'll start with what we know now out of Wuhan, we're now two years out from most of these individuals having suffered from COVID in the original outbreak in China. Um, and long-term study of uh, thousands of these individuals shows cognitive impairment more than a year out. Now we're two years out with some of this data. Uh, long-term cognitive impairments in more than 12% of the individuals and uh, real cognitive declines. Sorry about that phone. We're seeing a clear demonstration of peripheral neuropathy with actual nerve damage in a fair percentage of individuals who uh, have been diagnosed with COVID. Now, very small studies, in this case, only 17 people, but 59% show frank peripheral neuropathy with clear nerve damage. Uh, and other studies have looked at the same problem and seen some hints that there are immunological paradigms involved. Now, you can rule out autoimmune diseases like Sjogren's syndrome, but there are clear components of what is being termed a disimmune mechanisms going on in, neurologically in these individuals. Um, lumbar punches, uh, blood sampling, cranial MRIs, and CAT scans. 
in 19 patients showed a kind of plasma cytokine storm response um, with some clear impairment of the blood brain barrier. Something's breaking it down. And some hints at an inflammatory autoimmune response of some form going on in the brains of some of these individuals. Perhaps the one that's sparked the most conversation recently is a study that looked at uh, the possibility that you're looking at an escalated aging syndrome, which may or may not be reversible, unclear at this time. So you look at the young brain, uh, then the older brain. Some studies are now showing based on a UK biobank brain imaging of 45,000 individuals pre-COVID and during the epidemic, a diminished gray matter in the frontal and temporal lobes of individuals who suffered uh, COVID infection, not necessarily severe COVID and not necessarily with diagnosed long COVID. Indeed, it looks like the loss of brain volume occurs regardless of the severity of the actual COVID disease is focused around the olfactory bulb, which of course could explain the loss of smell and taste, and is in the same hippocampal area as is normally struck in Alzheimer's victims. This uh, has also led to study asking, is the brain itself actually shrinking at a pace that is accelerated? The brain always shrinks with aging. Uh, but at about 0.2% a year. Uh, what has been seen is an escalation in the pace of brain shrinkage uh, in some patients uh, suffering from COVID. Uh, and it could actually represent a net 10 year escalation in the aging process of the brain. Um, and so this of course leads to a whole set of concerns about whether or not we're looking at something that's really going to be lasting and it's going to tax the individuals and tax healthcare systems for years, if not decades into the future. Uh, the largest study looking at this problem was done by the Veterans Administration in the United States, looking at 154,000 veterans who have suffered COVID diagnosed infection compared to 5.8 million uninfected controls that have been through the system in the same time period, a roughly 10 and a half month period in the United States, looking at them a year later, and they see that survivors of COVID are 46% more likely to have been diagnosed with psychiatric disorders, including suicidal thoughts, depression, brain fog, sleep disturbances, and neurocognitive decline. The risk of brain fog, which again is a very mushy definition or, or diagnosis, is 80% higher than in controls. And that translates into 10.7 more cases per thousand in compared to uninfected populations and a 343% higher risk of developing um, these disorders if the individual is actually hospitalized. Now, this seems to contradict the UK study, which indicated that severity of disease did not predict whether or not you would suffer neurocognitive disorders. In this case, a huge increase if you were in fact hospitalized with COVID. So we have a great deal to try and figure out about what is going on. And we hope that the kinds of very innovative tools that have been applied by our winners of this year's Michelson Prize will also be brought to bear in understanding and dealing with uh, the, the future of these cognitive disorders and the tremendous possibility, horrible as it may be given the circumstances, that improving our understanding of these disorders could actually lead to breakthroughs in our understanding of how the brain ages, how dementia occurs, other perhaps Parkinson's and other disorders, and whether or not they can be treated through immunological means. So with that, I'd like to begin introducing you to this year's winners, uh, an absolutely astonishing group of individuals who have uh, had a real impact on their own work, their, their, their institution's work, and hopefully will have a big impact in the future of immunology writ large. First, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Rong Ma, who is currently at Emory University. 
She started out at uh, City University of Hong Kong, then did her PhD in, at Emory University in the chemistry and mechanobiology department, and now is a postdoc uh, in the laboratory of Khalid Salaita at Emory University. Her work is on mechanotechnology, uh, nano, I assume, which measures and interprets mechanical forces that may be involved in the human immune system. She hopes to find a way to really measure and predict immune responses, and in particular, in ways that could enhance the development of vaccines and of cancer therapy. Congratulations, Dr. Ma, I turn it over to you. My name is Rong Ma. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Emory University. I received the 2021 Michelson Prize for harnessing receptor mechanics as a marker for immunogenicity to isolate and identify potent T cell receptors and recognized antigens. Curiosity has always been one of the biggest motivations that pushes me forward in research. My research focused on developing molecular sensors made of DNA, which can detect receptor forces on piconewton scale generated by cells when they are probing the surrounding environment. We and others in the field have found that the T cell receptor employs mechanical forces as a part of its triggering mechanism in order to boost the specificity of antigen recognition. And by studying these forces, we found that the mechanical sampling of the antigen by the T cells is correlated with the T cell activation. So with this knowledge moving forward, we are trying to develop an assay to harness these mechanical forces transmitted through the receptors as a biomarker. This would be one of the very first attempts of harnessing the dynamic and biophysical nature of this antigen recognition process for potential cancer immunotherapy purposes. And in the long run, if this method is demonstrated to be effective for precisely identifying the potent T cell receptor antigen bindings, we could use it as a strategy to generate personalized new antigen cancer vaccine. As an early career researcher, the support from Michelson Prize will give me a lot of independence as well as the peace of mind to focus solely on this research. And it allows me to pursue the high-risk, high-reward project of developing a novel assay for new antigen and new antigen-specific T-cell identification. Congratulations, Dr. Ma. I have to ask you a couple of questions because it's so intriguing. Let's, let's step back a second. When you say there's, there are forces, and that there's a kind of a, some kind of a measurable force exerted by T cells. What exactly does that mean? What, describe that. Uh, so basically the T cells have many TCR, T cell receptors on its surface. And what it does is uh, it goes around and scan the surface of other cells. And when they encounter antigen, part of its the TCR triggering mechanism is to employ this little tug on the antigen. And if this interaction is potent enough, it can withstand that force and the TCR gets triggered. Um, so a lot of uh, groups have uh, found this mechanism or found evidence that suggests this mechanism through different methods. But I think it's still pretty new for the world of immunology. Uh, which makes it really interesting uh, to, for, for my proposal, yeah. It doesn't matter what kind of T cell? Uh, actually, the T cells that people have seen this phenomenon with, no matter it's with microscopy or a single, spe single molecule for spectroscopy, they uh, have a pretty wide span, I'd say. For example, the studies that we use, uh, in our studies, we use naive CD8 positive T cells. Mostly they will, uh, and we use cytotoxic T cells, which are the killer cells. But there are also groups that found this mechanism with CD4 cells, with T regs, and even with B cells, the B cell receptor on the B cells itself. So it's still pretty new for the field and it's still really like evolving really fast right now.
Well, may the force be with you. I'm going to, <laughs> and congratulations once again. I'm now going to turn to another one of your fellow winners, uh, Camila Consiglio, who uh, did all of her early work uh, in Brazil. Uh, Yay, Brazil, at the molecular biology work at Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul in Porto Alegre, and then went on to do PhD work uh, in immunology at Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center, upstate New York, Buffalo, and now is a postdoc in uh, Peter Broden's lab at the Karolinska in Sweden. So you're all over the place. <laughs> you've, you've seen much of the world and you are working on a very interesting question, something that actually was kind of in reverse, a subject of my research when I was an immunologist at Berkeley's ages, eons ago, I was interested in estrogen's effect on the immune system. You're looking at testosterone. And we know that we, we, you can go disease by disease and you have different rates of infection and different rates of response based on gender, but it's very poorly understood. Uh, Dr. Consiglio is working with a unique cohort of individuals who are undergoing sex change uh, transformation and uh, taking measurements, I assume, throughout their treatment and after they have uh, transitioned. Um, so this sounds fascinating. Please tell us more. I'm Camila Concilio, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Karolinska Institute. And I received the 2021 Michelson Prizes to understand how testosterone impacts the human immune system. I chose to become a scientist because I've always been very curious to understand the world around me. And so I chose specifically to go into the biomedical field to try to understand why people develop diseases and to try to find ways to better treat these diseases and prevent them. So my research is trying to understand how the immune system is different between men and women. And so we know that, for example, men tend to have more severe infections when compared to females. But on the flip side, women tend to have higher responses to vaccinations. So why is this? Why is it that women and men have these differences in immunity that can contribute to their susceptibility to different diseases, such as infectious diseases and autoimmunity? My research is trying to understand how a specific sex hormone, testosterone, that is different between males and females is impacting the immune system of humans. And so by trying to understand the impacts of testosterone in immunity, we can better understand how to prevent and treat infectious diseases and design optimal vaccine strategies that can fit one's biological sex. And so in my research, I'm combining highly advanced technologies that allow you to look at different components of the immune system all at the same time with computational methods. The Michelson Prizes will help me address a question that I've been interested in for a really long time of how is it that males and females have differences in their immune responses. And so by understanding how biological sex impacts the immune function, we can now understand better how diseases are developing differently between males and females and also optimize strategies to treat these infectious diseases, such as developing vaccine um, strategies that are fitting to one's biological sex. That was terrific and very exciting work. Um, you know, we, we know that there's a differential by gender in survival from infectious onslaughts in utero. And in the neonatal period, males are much more vulnerable and are far more likely to, to die in early life. And this is, of course, not just humans. This is, I think, most mammals. Uh, what does that tell you? Yeah, that's an absolutely really important question for us to answer. Um, so in the lab that I'm doing my postdoc in, we're interested in understanding the developing immune system in children. And this is one of the things that the MDs often tell us is when you know that you, there's a baby who's preterm and this baby is a baby boy, you're already more concerned for, you know, the effects that this baby boy might be at risk here. So increased infections and so on. And we still don't understand why this is happening. And so 
Sometimes we tend to think that these sex differences in infection severity are related to sex hormones, to, to, to testosterone, for example, but there's all these differences that happen before puberty, right? That could indicate maybe not a testosterone mediated effect, but also sex chromosome effects. And so this question is really important to be uh, figured out and to really discern, discern uh, the sex hormones and sex chromosome effects from one another so we can really pin down what are these pathways in immunity. They're impacting individual immune cells and how can we harness this for better uh, strategies. And so I'm really excited that this is the direction that the Michelson Price is allowing me to pursue to, you know, take this to the next leap, I would say. <laughs> how, how long do you imagine you will need to be following these individuals? So for the cohort that we're studying right now, we're studying them over the course of one year. And so we have baseline measurements before how their immune system looked before they transitioned, before they received sex hormones, and after three and 12 months after they receive um, sex hormone treatment. And so in this way, we're kind of, uh, we're able to see how the short-term effect of hormone treatment all the way to a very long term, I'd say one year, can affect their immune uh, status. Fascinating. Well, we're going to be eager to hear what you come up with. Thank, Thank you. you very much and congratulations once again. And finally, I, I want to introduce you to Dr. Nicholas Wu, who uh, is working on a whole range of issues related to how antibodies recognize their targets. He started off working uh, at the University of Virginia in biochemistry and completed his PhD at UCLA. Uh, and now after a postdoctoral fellowship in, at the Scripps Research Institute, he is now an assistant professor at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. He's working on trying to interpret complex human antibody repertoire, the whole range of antibodies uh, that may be involved in responding to a specific epitope, a target uh, on whatever it is you're looking at. Um, and he's using very sort of cutting edge, high throughput technology to get to the bottom of this and to antibody discovery. Let's, let's take a look at his video. My name is Nicholas Wu. I'm currently an assistant professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Scientists are still very far from comprehending the full complexity of immunology. My major research direction is to understand the molecular interaction between antibodies and viruses. The research outcome will not only advance the fundamental understanding of immunology, but also facilitate the development of next generation vaccines. So I really enjoy exploring novel ideas to push the boundary of knowledge. I also want to have a positive impact on the society. And being a scientist allows me to do both. I received the 2021 Microsoft Prizes for my work on systematic identification of antibody epitope. With the recognition of the Microsoft Prize, I feel more comfortable to explore high-risk, high-reward projects, both intellectually and financially. Data from these projects will potentially determine the research directions of my lab in the next decade. In addition, the Microsoft Prize will help me establish international reputation which is critical for my career advancement as a junior scientist. Congratulations. Thank you. You know, I think probably at this point, the best known epitopes in the world that the, the whole world imagination knows about are the spike protein epitopes on the COVID vaccine, the SARS-CoV-2. Absolutely, yep and the various variants that arise where you can see that the virus is actively mutating to get around that immune response, the antibodies coming into those epitopes. Um, how, how could your work fit in with that picture and perhaps help in our understanding of how, both how escape mutations arise and how the immune system recognizes those escapes? Yes, uh, I mean, this is an important question. Um, so um, what we have been um, uh, looking into is um, to understand um, uh, how antibodies target um, things, right? So, um, and then this uh, spike protein is definitely like something that we are actively looking at. Um, so um, 
what what we're trying to do is to understand how um, the antibody sequence. So every antibody every antibody has a sequence. Just they're just protein. So they have a sequence, and based on the sequence, can we predict where it binds to? So if we can, then um, it will allow us to develop vaccines um, against um, all these kind of variants. Because if we know um, uh, what the variant is like, I mean, we have the sequence, and then if we can predict what can bind to those sequence, then uh, it will help improve our vaccine design. We can specifically elicit some types of antibodies that can target the variants. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say this is still um, uh, very early um, to say whether whether we, we can do it, but I I, I do believe um, uh, we are able to do that at some point. You know, it's interesting because one of the techniques that uh, the invading world uses, whether it's microbes or cancer cells or whatever, is to basically sugarcoat themselves, wrap themselves in glycoproteins uh, so that they are hiding. Mm -hmm. they, they put a, a coating over themselves so that our immune system doesn't recognize what you're talking about, the epitopes mm -hmm. sticking out. Are you able to get to the bottom of any of that? Um, yeah, I mean, um, if you look at, um, uh, uh, I mean, some, some viruses have more uh, sugar coating than others. For example, HIV is like so heavily um, coated by sugars. Um, but we, our, our, our bodies still are still able to generate antibodies against HIV. Um, so if you, I mean, uh, if you look at the antibody response against HIV versus other viruses, um, uh, we are seeing some distinct, like some um, sequence features on the antibodies that allow them to penetrate uh, the sugar coat. So that's also something that we're trying to look at to understand how our body can, um, like, you know, kind of like get around um, that kind of um, hiding mechanism um, to target the virus. Um, yeah, I mean, this is definitely an exciting and uh, uh, ongoing active research direction. So it's it's partly about epitope presentation. And partly about epitope recognition. Yes, that's they're correct. Very yep. different pieces. Yeah, they're, 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 they're different pieces, but they're kind of um, related. So, well, congratulations, Dr. Wu. It's really Thank you. very exciting. And of course, we all want to see the results of your work. Uh, in fact, we want, all want to see the results of all of your work because these are all very interesting projects that will have uh, big implications going down the road. Um, you know, I've, I've said before that these are very competitive prizes and they're ones that uh, are much sought after. I think uh, it, may, it may sometimes escape recognition that they have a big impact on how people go through the rest of their careers and what happens thereafter. I'd, I'd like to turn this now back to Dr. Wayne Koff and perhaps Wayne, you can say just a little something about what we know about how the Michelson Prize has affected the career trajectories of individuals who have been fortunate to receive uh, the award in one of the prior rounds. Uh, well, thanks. Thanks again, Laurie. And it's, uh, it's really wonderful to be here and to, and, to, and to see each one of the videos, which I actually hadn't seen before. Um, and um, and see how how well these these individuals are going to go ahead. This is um, this is another class, if you if you will, of the Michelson Prize winners. Um, we I, I think we have eleven winners now in total over the, over the the uh, the four years. Um, and we've already seen uh, with the number of the people who who received the uh, the initial prizes. A, uh, a giant leap ahead in terms of the, the uh, advancement in, in their own career. Um, one of the individuals, Ansa Sapathy at Stanford, uh, rec received a job at Stanford uh, you know, shortly, you know, shortly after the prize, has started a biotech company, has received NIH grants, et cetera. Another individual, Laura McKay, um, at the University of Melbourne, um, has also received a number of awards. Has received internal, internal, and external um, um, uh, support, um, and um, is doing ex extremely well in terms of the numbers of the of, of the publications in really high high tiered kinds of, of journals. Um, we've seen this across the board for all of the of the winners. 
And um, I, I expect we're going to see the same for uh, 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 Nicholas and Rang and, and Camilla. Um, so we are proud of all of you. Um, I think, as, uh, as you said in the, in the beginning, we are just about to, to open up the portal of the next, next round of the competition of the Michelson Prizes. And we're looking for the best and the, and the brightest out there. Um, it's, it's, it's one of the best things that uh, the Human Vaccines Project has, has done since, since the beginning. You know, obviously our mission uh, is, to, is to make an AI model of the human immune system, you know, which is a, is a long way off. However, um, these, these kinds of, uh, of individuals who, who we see, you know, here and who we've awarded in, in, in the past are key to, to the success, frankly, of us achieving our mission. And when we do achieve our mission, it's going to trans transform human health. And so um, I'm really proud of all of you. And you too, Laurie, you've been with us since, since the beginning. Um, and uh, it's been it's been quite a ride, and we hope you know we'll have you back a year from now when we announce the next round of Michelson Prize winners. Well, and you know we have a little time, and I want to do something we've never done before. I want to ask uh, Nicholas, Camilla, and Ron to unmute and put your video back on. And what I want to do is ask each of you if you have a question for one of the other winners something you'd like to know about their plan and their work. I'm gonna start with you, Ron. You can pick who you would like to ask your question to. Yeah. Unmute. yeah. That's very exciting. Um, so I actually was very interested in what uh, Camila was talking about her research, uh, the gender difference that she sees uh, in the immune response. And it's just the kind of resonant with what we have noticed in terms of the in terms of the mechanobiology of these cells, no matter it's immune cells or platelets, whenever I, I vaguely remember some of the data that one of our lab member collected uh, a few years back. So when she put the cells on our tension probes and observe how active they are in the, when there's a uh, ligand for the receptors to recognize, they realize that there's actually a difference in male and female. Uh, although we were using mouse, but there was difference. And it's just like kind of strike to me that, that her research could, there could be molecular mechanism behind this and there could be a mechanobiology that is coupled with the molecular, uh, the, the chemical part of it. Uh, behind this phenomenon. And I thought that was a really interesting direction. Maybe we should discuss more about it. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah, I mean, this, this is the crazy thing. And the most exciting part about being one of the winners here, you get to meet people that are doing such awesome science in a completely unrelated field. And yet we find a connection, right? Yeah. And so I, I didn't know about this and I would even ask you back, you know, if, do you know what exactly was different between them? Do you think it's in terms of their cell membrane composition, maybe it's the type of lipids that are in there, or, you know. Uh, I'm not sure it's about the membrane fluidity of the cell membrane, but mm. I think it's likely it's linked to the cytoskeleton uh, dynamics uh, inside the cells. And these cytoskeleton dynamics are actually uh, regulated by a lot of other proteins inside the cells, which can be affected by, for example, hormones and some other uh, factors, for example, the, the things that cells secrete if they're inflamed or, uh, uh, for example, we also have uh, data that shows that uh, cells, T cells, specific T cells treated with uh, serum that contained a deposite before, which means they're like fat tissues. Mm -hmm. They are a lot less mechanically active, which, explains partially explains or at least resonant with why like people have these issues might have a weakened immune system so uh, these are really wow. interesting questions that we are very very excited to pursue and it is yeah, I, can't wait to I mean for the average person listening to us right now let me let me translate a little bit you're actually <laughs> suggesting that um, the differences based on gender of the individual that these cells are inside of 
could actually be profoundly different that, uh, cells that are not part of a gender specific system, organ system. They're not of the genitalia, they're not breast cells or what have you. They're just that the actual structure of the cells might be different based on uh, which hormones are circulating. That's fascinating. Nicholas, do you have a question that you'd like to ask one of the other winners? Yes, I, I, I also found this um, uh, gender difference um, issue quite uh, fascinating. Um, so, you know, like when we, uh, I mean, um, I'm not sure if it also apply to um, innate immune response, uh, but um, like, you know, when we study um, uh, tissue culture, I mean, we, we, we use a lot of tissue culture to study um, um, viral infection. Um, do you think gender, like this kind of gender difference is also um, happen in like in innate immune response like at a, like a tissue, I mean, in a, in a cell culture level? Um, since like when we're using the cell, so the, the like different cells, um, they're from different, they're, they're from different, um, uh, uh, people with uh, different genders, right? So I'm wondering if that actually creates some sort of um, artifact, or I wouldn't say artifact, but like some. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so yeah. just just so that our listeners, our viewers, follow this because mm -hmm. this is a big deal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're suggesting it's possible that a lot of immunology research might be flawed because it's failed to uh, account for what the gender was of the individual animal or human that the cells came from. What do you think, Camilla? No, I think that's it's a really good point to make. I think until I, until I was doing my PhD, it wasn't necessary for grants at the NIH, as, as, I'm, as I believe, to include um, why you're, or how, how do I put this, um, which biological sex you're studying, you weren't really necessarily needing to justify. And, uh, I think starting 2015, 2016, you had to justify why are you using females or male mice or subjects to you know, understand such biological concepts. And this is so important because coming down to your question too about innate immunity, I mean, it's been shown that biological sex impacts immunity at different levels. So you look at innate immune cells, you have changes in macrophages, like phagocytosis is different between the sexes and K cell function. And then you look at adaptive immune function, T cells, B cells, all of these are all being affected by sex hormones and by chromosomal sex as well. And so it's if you take into account just a, a jerk at cell that might come from a male, I, I'm not actually sure, then you're completely biasing yourself, right? So we need to keep take into account that these biological factors matter and, and really take this into consideration for our studies, for our conclusions and for next directions. Well, That's very Nicholas, interesting. I, I'd like to throw it to you on that one because you know we're we've gone pretty far down the path of research in immunology over the last several decades before people really start saying, wait a second, what's the age of the donor from which you've derived the cells that you're studying? And how does age affect this immune response? Now you're gonna ask, what's the gender? Exactly. <laughs> how does that affect the immune response? Do you think in your epitope system, mm -hmm. you could factor for these issues? Yes, that's actually one of the, um uh one of the areas I'm, I'm really interested in looking at into um because our, our our immune system actually kind of like evolve over time um as we are as we are accumulating more uh as we, as we are accumulating immune history um for example it has been shown that uh, people with different um influenza infection history will react um will respond to a uh, flu infection very differently it depends on uh, the types of flu um like the the, the actual strain of, of the flu um, so yeah, so uh, we we hope to uh, like once we have a um, system built up um, that we can predict um, what antibodies bind to, then we can look into um, individuals' repertoire of antibodies and see and, and try to predict if if they will respond differently to a different flu infection or a different virus infection. Um, and then of course this will um, this is correlating to age because as you as people age, um, as I said, uh, the immune repertoire evolve. Um, so yeah, um, we, we're not sure what we will find, but uh, that's certainly something that uh, we should be able to look at, um, yeah. Well, and of course, you know, as in my remarks, I was saying how difficult it is for us right now to understand long COVID because of the epidemiology of it. Are we looking at an, an actual pathogenesis 
resulting from the virus itself or from the immune response to the virus? Or are we looking at general social factors of social isolation and depression induced by what we've all been through, living in our homes forever, getting sick of our offices and our families and, and our, our squished together lives? And uh, I can imagine that you're, you're going to have the same problem looking at gender because or, or age, because uh, people's lifestyles are different. The nature of their external exposures, their workplaces, uh, how much they are the one, the primary caregiver of children and exposed to all the antigens carried, carried by their children from school and so on, uh, what kind of a workplace they are in, what they're exposed to in that workplace. Um, suddenly you realize that correlation and causation becomes a tricky problem across the board. I wonder if any of you have any thoughts about that. Well, I'll jump in, Laurie. I think that's absolutely true. And I think we, you know, have, have seen it, frankly, over the last 18 months. We have, you know, the elderly, of course, have uh, have the most of the of the morbidity and the mortality in this, you know, in this in this period. But there are a number of elderly individuals who have done extremely well with this virus and who have not gotten sick. And, um, and there is a, you know, a hypothesis out there that, that we and others have made that the baseline is predictive of the outcome and we don't understand the baseline. Um, and, so, and, and so one of the things and one of the, of the interests that we have certainly in, in the Human Vaccines Project, we've, we've done a lot of work in the, in the, in the B cell in the T cell, um, uh, the the repertoire areas and you know and sequencing of the of the BCRs and the in the TCRs, but as Nicholas has pointed out, that we're a long way away from the 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 map of what the ligands are of each each B cell receptor and each each T cell receptor. But I actually see that as feasible over you know you know over time the the exponential increase in the in the tools that we have and the and the sensitivity of the tools. I mean just just remember a decade ago we weren't you know in, involved in any 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 single cell analysis at all and such. And and we didn't have the capacity, the the capacities with AI and, and machine learning now to begin to have to have models of systems in, in ways that we have now. So I think we're going to solve these problems. You know, it's gonna it's gonna take us a little bit of time, and it's gonna be a long and winding road, as we know. But as as Nichols pointed out, I mean, and, and the influenza virus is a is a perfect is a perfect case. Each one of us has an immunologic imprint, and we get that imprint in generally in the in the initial eighteen months of life, and we don't understand anything about it yet. And and if we if we did understand it, you know, it would it would give us a whole new new set of ideas about how to make a universal influenza vaccine uh, and similarly how to make a universal vaccine against the the, the, the coronavirus. So um, I guess what I'm trying to say here is that, is, is that the, the human immune system is at the core of everything in terms of infectious and non-communicable diseases. Um, and we're learning more and more about it every day. Um, and again, we have uh, examples here of, uh, of of, you know, three of the up and coming, you know, leading, uh, uh, you know, researchers who, who are going to trailblaze here for the decades to come. So um, I'm not sure I answered your question, but, uh, you know, I think this is, this is a really exciting time for all of us. And hopefully, as, as you know, Laurie, as, we, as we've done in the past, hopefully this is the, is the last of the of the Zoom award ceremonies for us, and we can get, get back into into in person meetings and the and the dinners and the award ceremonies that we've done. And a glass past. of champagne to each of you, and we bring <laughs> in and we and we bring in all of the of the winners of of the years into those meetings, and we've already have seen a number of the collaborations that have just occurred over over the dinners. So we we look forward to to you know in welcoming you all back at our next award ceremony a, a year from now, hopefully in person, hopefully at a nice place and hopefully with a nice meal. And I would just to tell the audience so that people really understand the significance 
of what Gary and Ilya uh, Michelson have so generously done with this award is that if you look at the data now on grants out of the NIH, uh, you can see that they are heavily skewed to longtime grant recipients. It's very hard for a young scientist to break through all those barriers and get their share of the pie to do their research because it's so dominated so heavily skewed towards firmly established tenured researchers at major research institutions. And so the, the trick of what happens with the Michelson Prize is it gives you a little nudge, uh, just a little edge to get you closer to um, those much older and more established scientists so that you're on a grant pathway that will carry you through to your you know, professional career and allow you to build your own laboratory and move into this space on a permanent level. And I hope that you find that the, the little nudge that we're giving you today will help you in that direction. And it's for the good of all of us that are watching you because we want to see the results of your work. I thank everybody involved in the Michelson Prize, particularly Gary Michelson, himself and Wayne Koff and all the good folks at the Human Vaccines Project for allowing us to share the uh, joy with you and to hear about your work. And uh, to all of you, again, who are watching and are young scientists yourselves, the deadline, it opens up April 1st for your applications for the next round of the Michael Surprises. Thanks, everybody. I think we're at our conclusion. And again, um, Happy smiles go off and I guess privately have your glass of champagne. <laughs> thanks, Larry. And thanks, thanks Larry. to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye to all. all right.